Infinite Jest, Part 17, by David Foster Wallace, 3, November, Y-D-A-U. Hal could hear the phone console ringing as he dropped his gear bag and took the room key from around his neck. The phone itself had been orange, and its plastic case was transparent, and you could see the phone's guts, mmm, yellow. Why do I always get the feeling I'm interrupting you? In the middle of some, like, vigorous self-abuse session. It was Oren's voice. It's always multiple rings. Then you're always a little breathless when you do. Do what? A certain sweaty urgency to your voice. Are you one of the 99% of the adolescent males, Hallie? Hal never liked talking on the phone after he'd gotten high, in secret down in the pump room. Even if there was water or liquid handy to keep the cotton at bay, he didn't know why this was so. It just made him uneasy. You're sounding hale and fit, oh? You can tell me, you know. No shame in it. Let me tell you, boy. I did myself raw for years on end on that hill. Hal estimated over 60% of what he told Oren on the phone, since Oren had abruptly started calling again this spring, was a lie. He had no idea why he liked lying to Oren on the phone so much. He looked at the clock. Where are you? Home, snug and toasty. It's 90 plus degrees out. That would be Fahrenheit, I'm assuming. This city is made of all glass and light. The windows are like high beams coming at you. The air has that spilled fuel shimmer to it. So, to what do we owe? Sometimes I wear sunglasses even in the house. Sometimes at the stadium I hold my hand up and look at it and I swear I can see right through it, like that thing with the flashlight in your hand. Hands seem to be some sort of theme to this call thus far. On the way in... From the lot off the street, I saw a pedestrian in a pith helmet stagger and, like, claw at the air and pitch forward onto his face. Another Phoenician felled by the heat, I think to myself. It occurred to Hal that, although he lied about meaningless details to Oren on the phone, it had never occurred to him to consider whether Oren was ever doing the same thing. This induced a spell of involuted marijuana-type thinking— that led quickly again to Hal's questioning whether or not he was really all that intelligent. SATs are six weeks away, and Pemulus is less and less helpful on the math, if you want to know what I'm doing all day. The man's face made a sizzling noise when it hit the pavement, like bacon-caliber sizzling. He's still lying there. I see out the window. He's not moving anymore. Everyone's avoiding him, going around him. He looks too hot to touch. A little Hispanic kid made off with his hat. Have you all had snow yet? Describe snow for me again, Hallie. I'm begging you. So, you go around with this image of me, sitting around during the day, masturbating. Is that what you're saying? I've actually been thinking of maneuvering the whole Kleenex concession at ETA as a venture. That, of course, would mean actually contacting CT and the moms. Me and this forward-looking reserve QB have been making inquiries, putting out feelers, volume discounts, preferred vendor status, maybe a sideline in unscented lubricants. Any thoughts? Oh, I'm sitting here actually missing New Orleans, kid. It's be just coming up on Advent, I think. The quarter always gets really quaint and demure during Advent. It almost never rains down there during Advent for some reason. People remark on it, the phenomena. You sound somehow a little off to me, O. I'm heat crazed. I might be dehydrated. What's the word? Everything's looking all beige and powdery all day. Trash bags have been swelling up and spontaneously combusting out in the dumpsters. These sudden rains of coffee grounds and orange peels. The displacement guys in the bar just have to wear asbestos gloves. Also, I met somebody, Hallie. A possibly very special somebody. Uh Uh-oh, dinner time. Triangles are clanging over in the west. Hey, Hallie, though, hang on. Kidding aside for a second, what all do you know about separatism? Hal stopped for a moment. You mean in Canada? Is there any other kind? 
Ennett House Drug and Alcohol Recovery House was founded in the year of the Whopper by a nail-tough old chronic drug addict and alcoholic who had spent the bulk of his adult life under the supervision of Massachusetts Department of Corrections before discovering the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at MDC Wadpole and undergoing a sudden experience of total self-surrender and spiritual awakening in the shower during his fourth month of continuous AA sobriety. This recovered addict alcoholic, who, in his new humility, so valued AA's tradition of anonymity that he refused even to use his first name, was known in Boston AA simply as the guy who didn't even use his first name. He opened Ennett House within a year of his parole, determined to pass on to other chronic drug addicts and alcoholics what had been so freely given to him in the E-tier shower. Ennett House leases a former physician's dormitory in the Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital Complex, managed by the United States Veterans Administration. Ennett House is equipped to provide 22 male and female clients a nine-month period of closely supervised residency and treatment. Ennett House was not only founded, but originally renovated, furnished, and decorated by the nameless local AA ex-con, who, since sobriety doesn't exactly mean instant sainthood, used to select teams of early recovery dope fiends on after-hours boosting expeditions at area furniture and housewares establishments. This legendary anonymous founder was an extremely tough old Boston double-A galoot who believed passionately that everyone, no matter how broad the trail of slime they dragged in behind them, deserved the same chance at sobriety. Through utterly, total surrender, he'd been granted. It's a kind of extremely tough love found almost exclusively in tough old Boston galoots. He sometimes, the founder, in the house's early days, required incoming residents to attempt to eat rocks, as in like rocks from the ground, to demonstrate their willingness to go to any lengths for the gift of sobriety. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health's Division of Substance Abuse Services eventually requested that this practice be discontinued. And it was not any part of the nameless Ennett House founder's name, by the way. The rock thing, which has become a grim bit of mythopoeia, now trotted out to illustrate how cushy the present Ennett residents have it, was probably not as wacko as it seemed to the division of SAS, since many of the things veteran double A's ask newcomers to do and believe seem not much less wacko than trying to chew feldspar e.g. be so strung out, you can feel your pulse in your eyeballs, have the shake so badly you make a spatter painting on the wall every time somebody hands you a cup of coffee, have the life forms out of the corner of your eye be your only distraction from the chainsaw racing chatter in your head, sitting there, and have some old lady with cat hair on her nylons come at you to hug you and to tell you to make a list of all the things you're grateful for today. You'll wish you had some feldspar handy, too. In the year of the Yushitiyu, 2007 mimetic resolution cartridge view motherboard easy to install upgrade for Infernatrine interlaced TP systems for home, office, or mobile. The nameless founder's death of a cerebral hemorrhage at age 68 went unremarked outside the Boston AA community from internal interlace system email memo C A H N N E 22357 5634-22 Claims Adjustment Headquarters State Farm Insurance Companies Incorporated Bloomington, Illinois 26 June Year of Dairy Products from the American Heartland from Murray F at CLMSHQNNE 22.626 INTCOM to Powell G backslash Sanchez M backslash Perry K at C L M H Q N N E dot six two six I N T C O M message guys get a load my death of a bad day Metro Boston region twenty two this spring comp claim Witnesses deposed by Boston Workmen's Comp establishment claimant impaired and the emergency room rep lists a blood alcohol of 0.3 plus, so be pleased to know we're clear 
on the 357-5 liability end, but face facts confirmed below by witnesses and CYD accident repped. Here's just the first page. Get a load. Murray F. at CLM SHQNN 22.626 INTCOM 26YDPAHO 112317 backslash page 1. Dwayne R. Glynn, 176 North Fennel Boulevard, Stoneham, Massachusetts, 021-808-754, backslash 4, June 21st, YODPFTAH, Workman's Accident Claims Office, State Farm Insurance, 1 State Farm Plaza, Normal, Illinois, 6170 Backslash six. Dear Sir, I am writing in response to your request for additional information to block number three of the accident reporting form. I put trying to do the job alone as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more fully, and I trust that the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, March 27th, I was alone working on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 900 kilograms of brick left over. Rather than laboriously carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the brick into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 900 kilograms of bricks. You will note in block number 11 of the accident reporting form, I weigh 75 kilograms. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull and the broken collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulleys. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of considerable pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel from the force of hitting the ground. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed approximately 30 kilograms. I refer you again to my weight of 75 kilograms in block number 11. As you could imagine, still holding the rope, I began a rather rapid descent from the pulley down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the laceration of my legs and lower body. The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my impact with the brick-strewn ground below. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks, in considerable pain, unable to stand or move, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and unfortunately let go of the rope, causing the barrel to begin a... in transmission. Intercom 6... Two, six.